Okay, kia ora everyone. Um, my name is Raynor. I'm the National Sport Development Director at Yachting New Zealand. Um, at the moment, wearing um, the safety officer hat while we're in transition of finding our replacement for Angus, who served us wonderfully well um, for 10 years. Um, we also have some YNZ staff on the call tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce our regional development managers. We've got Kelly. Give us a quick wave, Kelly. Um, we've got Hayden. Hey, guys. We've got Wayne. I think we've got an Ian Gardner in the house, but we can't see. All right, so hopefully these um, people aren't unfamiliar to you. Um, regional development managers, um, their role is to be conduits between clubs and Yachting New Zealand. Um, so any com further conversations out of tonight's uh, meeting can be taken up with the regional development managers um, and they're more than happy to help keep these conversations going. Um, so I would like to formally welcome everyone along to our first um, for a wee while um, online keelboat and trailer yacht safety forum. Um, just a quick side note, I've been in a safer boating forum meeting all day today. So we are in line this week with the safer boating week, um, which many of you may or may not know about. Um, but essentially the theme from the safer boating forum, which is a group of organisations led by Maritime New Zealand, um, essentially organisations in the recreational craft sector. Um, the theme for their safer boating week this week is come home safe, um, which is essentially around um, adhering to the safer boating code, which are things like checking marine forecasts, carrying two forms of communications and wearing life jackets that are suitable to your vessel and activity you're engaging in. Those are the key messages that Maritime have to our wider maritime community. Um, some relevance to our care in, in our spaces, um, but more for that generic um, community um, around keeping safe on the water. However, tonight the purpose of our forum is for us to share safety processes and systems in the interest of learning and improving. Um, so we're going to hear from three wonderful speakers who have um, prepared some presentations uh, for us tonight um, on topics related to clubs and classes running great and safe events for our sailing members. So firstly, tonight uh, we're going to hear from Ian Clouston, um, who will tell us um, a bit about a man overboard incident from the Bay of Ireland Sailing Week in January this year. And he's going to share um, what he and the organising authority are putting in place for 2024, following the lessons from that event. Secondly, we're going to hear from John Henry from SANS, who will share how SANS prepare and communicate to their members in the lead up and during major events like the Around North Island Race. Thirdly, we'll hear from John Butcher from Gulf Harbour. He will share some ways that clubs can encourage a safety culture with their members and boat owners and crews. Um, and lastly, there'll be a quick update from myself um, on behalf of Cork around D and um, an invitation to be part of a peer review process with regards to keelboat event documentation. First up, Bayer and Sailing Week. So I would. I'd love to introduce Ian Clouston. Um, how we're going to run tonight is going to be a bit of an interview conversation um, type presentation. Um, and Ian, if you'd like to turn your microphone off, on, off mute. All right. We welcome you along. So Ian, Thank you very um, much, please introduce yourself and your and your role at Bay Island Sailing Week, please. Yeah, my name is Rian Cluson, as it's on the screen. I'm an international race officer, have been now for a number of years. Um, been involved with race management since about 1989 and 19, uh, 1990. Um, been involved with them. Um, Bay Island Sailing Week now for possibly 10 years. I um, was on board to start with as a just as a race officer for the Island Racing Division. Um, but as the years have um, moved on, um, I took over the role of principal race officer for the whole event. And then this last year, I took on the role also of 
the um, chairman of the of the event for the same administration and also for um, racing PRO as well. And on that, I was still the race officer for the island racing course. So uh, things have changed a lot. Um, but uh, we have another race officer on board from now on as well. So my role will change um, as of the coming year. I'll still be principal race officer, but um, I will be based uh, either on land or on a uh, rib running around the courses just to observe um, what's going on and listening to what's going on. So basically that was my role um, in the Bay of Ireland Sailing Week. Um, this year was um, the first year since I've been involved and I believe the first year long before me that we had to abandon the racing on one day or we had the weather that we've never experienced before. It was being abandoned before because of no wind earlier on in the, in the piece, but uh, this year we had the opposite uh, end of the spectrum. So um, a lot of lessons were learned and um, we've taken a lot on board and we had a good debrief afterwards. So um, we are outlaying um, quite a bit of money to improve a few things which we learned. And, but basically... Um, well, should we dig into the um, specifics of, of what we wanted to, to cover off tonight, Ian? So do you want to start with telling us a bit about the, yep. the man overboard incident that occurred during the rugby? Not a problem. Um, the man overboard incident was on the Thursday, um, which was the last day of racing because of the weather. And um, because of the change of with the maritime, not the maritime, the marine mammal sanctuary that's now in place in the Bay of Islands, we've, we've been told we can't use um, one of the channels for a mark rounding run of the island, so we can't just go around Robinson Island. We've got to go right up around the, the whole lot of them. Um, so that made my course a little bit longer than I wanted to. But um, I think with the amount of boats that I had on that course, it was still safe enough and they were, they were fairly well um, inside to be able to cope with it. During the race, I heard over my radio, which were on Channel 17, uh, somebody said about a Mayday call. My straight away I went on to find out who made that radio call, and uh, I believe it was a uh, boat called Zinzibar, and also the Mar um, one of the naval um, chicos as well. I asked my skipper, the owner of the boat, who was down below, whether he'd heard anything on the radios. He hadn't heard anything, so. Um, Toms weren't the best being around the corner. We were just around the corner of Tarpeka Point. And I was quickly sent my two big inflatables out into the area to become radio and also to um, be on the spot for any, anything that was required to do. Um, and all I was getting was intermittent um, radio uh, things that were going on. And I, I kept asking the skipper of our, or the owner of our boat if he's heard anything else on the other channels, and he says no. So um, I got him to ring Russell Radio and ring Coast Guard, and both came back as a negative um, response. So we just carried on and did what we had to do. And in the meantime, I think it was after about 20 minutes, I suppose, we finally heard that one of the boats had taken the person on board and after a great effort between them and the Navy to put a grid pattern search in place um, to try and find the person, uh, which was luckily the owner of Zinzibar is a maritime skipper and also the Navy, obviously, they're well experienced in doing these things. So between the two of them, they coordinate a very good um, grid search for her and you know over a short time luckily she was found so then Zinzibar came on board as they were coming around and said we've got the person on board we're going to head to Russell uh, Wharf where we'll 
put her on a ferry or some other transport and be taken across to Paihia. And I said, no, um, we had two fast ribs big enough and they were there. So I had the person transferred from Zinzibar, which was a big catch, onto one of our ribs and then transported directly across to to um, to Paihia Wharf, where apparently I believe there was a person there waiting for to meet them and um, and then I carried on trying to find out what actually happened um, through the my, uh, inquiries about what was going on. But because of a bit of lack of communication with radios and other bits and pieces, it was a bit sketchy. Um, but at the luckily, the result was perfect in the end. Um, but we, we looked at it and we've, we've reviewed the whole thing. And um, when it came down to it, um, I thought this is a serious enough incident to be reported, as I had all done a couple of others on during the event. And I know it's the skipper's responsibility to report these incidents. I took it on my own back to um, to report the incident the next day, I think it was the day after, when I came back to Auckland and put a report into Marit Maritime New Zealand. And um, I got a rep uh, reply back very quickly from them, say they'd received it. And following on from that, um, our committee had a big debrief on things we could improve on and what actually happened. Um, and there was one person who came up on the committee said he had heard that Channel 16 had been a little bit intermittent in the Bay, Bay, Bay of Islands recently, uh, but me not being from the Bay of Islands, I couldn't um, question that. But um, yeah, so, and I just, we looked at our communications. Um, just yeah, before well, we ju jump into those details, um, could we just just stop and quickly um, have a quick chat about um, Maritime New Zealand reporting? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it went very well because you just go onto the line and there's, they got their online forms there, which I filled out. Um, and what do you think that was there? Um, the, the, what actually happened, the, the review of the overview of the events? and um, left it for them to, to deal with and come back to me, which they did um, probably the next day, um, very, very promptly. And um, I had a couple of verbal phone calls with them um, as to what actually took place as well. And uh, I was told that it'll be reviewed. And then I got another phone call back a um, couple of days later saying that the other reports I put in had been dealt with and closed, but this one was still open. And it just went on for oh, probably for two or three months, I suppose, that um, I was waiting for feedback from Maritime. And every time I got hold of them, they said, oh, they're still waiting for a bit of, bit of stuff. We forwarded them our debrief uh, from what we went through after the, after the event. And all the information we could, and then in July, um, I got a report, uh, an email back from Maritime to say that the, um, they were happy with, with what we happened um, and uh, what, we're, what we're planning to do is go and um, that closed the inquiry. So uh, that's, that's already what happened about it, but I'm, I'm right. glad I did it um, because... It's one of those things. If you didn't do it and something happened, you'd be, you know, you'd be wondering the whole time. So, um, but it may have caused a lot of a lot of issues. But I'm I'm happy that I did. All right. So let's just pause here for two seats, Ian, before we move into, um, you know, the feedback that you receive from Maritime around the changes that the organising authority is going to make, and we'll we'll share that with our community shortly. But what what I want to just highlight is um, the responsibility um, for skippers um, in that should there be an accident or an incident or a serious injury on the water, whether it's part of racing or not, um, there is a legal requirement to report it. Um, I feel like this is a, an area that not many people know about. Um, there's also a requirement as well, um, depending on the region, um, to also notify your local harbour master as well. 
Um, so these are just a couple of uh, points that I feel like it's important to highlight um, that obligation. Um, I know for a fact and having sort of followed up on this particular um, report, it didn't result in a formal investigation. What it was was a open conversation, which they kept open for a period of time. Um, so there was no official investigation or official report um, done into this particular incident, um, but there were communications around um, things things that could be done better and, and lessons learned. Um, yeah, so I essentially wanted just to bring that to um, the highlight for, for you to pass on to your um, skippers. But um, this incident, it, it doesn't hurt to have more than one person reporting an incident. So uh, ultimately, the skipper of the person overboard would have reported, as well as um, the club is, is welcome to report as well. I'm sure all that time is open to receiving multiple for the same incident. I'm happy to support and help people with that process at any point as well. I've got a New Zealand to get a support. I've got a commercial skipper background, so I'm not overly familiar, but semi-familiar with this process. And we have a good relationship with Maritime New Zealand as well. All right, so moving on in the takeaways, let's move into what Vive Island Sailing Week um, lessons have been learned and, and what you're going to put in place um, this coming year. Well, this yeah, this coming year it hasn't been done in my time in the um, at the event, but we'll be holding a sailors briefing on the Tuesday night after registration um, in the marquee, and we have a new location this year, so um, everybody will know where it is. So uh, we'll have a full sailors briefing. So there should, it has to be at least one representative of the skipper or somebody else from that boat present at that um, that briefing. Um, they'll also, I've been do, uh, talking in line with uh, John Belger from Predict Wind. He's going to uh, come along and, well not come along, but um, give us the latest up-to-date weather forecast every morning and um, for that area so we can put that in place. Um, we're also having a, I think we've still got it now, but there'll be a a skipper's WhatsApp group um, set up and um, we've already got them for our committees and volunteers and that but there'd be one specifically for for the sailor for the skippers of all the boats so all the information will come up um, on that we do understand that a lot of people won't have their cell phones on up on the deck area but as long as they, they know that it, they keep an eye on that anyway um, We've never had a sign on, sign off because of the, um, the location of the event and boats coming out of Kerry Kerry and Opur and Russell and everywhere else. So this year, this coming year, all boats will be required to sail past the stern of the signal boat and log on and get acknowledgement back from the um, person on that boat who's doing the um, sign-ons for that course. It's a safety for us to know who's on the course and who's not on the course at the end of the day. So that's going to happen this time. Okay. Um, we move into safety reminders. Yeah, well, we're going to, there is going to be a safety reminder about the, the Y flag um, uh, this year as well, okay. which um, for everybody to know, the skippers should know what the Y flag is, but we have to remember that a lot of the some of the um, competitors in this event are not hardened race um, yachties. So we're going to have to, uh, at our briefing, and strictly reinforce what the Y flag is for them. So when everybody's got a, um, um, has, has got a, a what, what it's all about. We'll also be having a safety person as well this year who will be going around and doing spot safety checks on boats. Um, obviously, not being all in one place uh, to start with in the morning, that this person will, will float around in the, um, in the inflatable and um, have a list on board that he wants to come alongside and wants the uh, skippers or the crew to produce um, for the safety area that what, what's required. Um, 
which I think we did it a couple of years ago. Um, or oh, three, be three years ago now we did it. Um, we got a little bit of kickback from some of them, some of the sailors, but uh, we're going to go full out this year and do as much as we can for it. We have a couple of things in mind, um, but uh, yeah, that's a definite for this time. Um, there'll also be in the registration packs, which will be um, when you register, there'll be a incident report form that any incident there to um, happens on board to be filled out and given back to the race hut um, at the end of the day. So the, the um, administration can review them and they will go through and see which is they think is, is um, needs to be determined to be carried on with or whether the um, we're happy with what the skipper and the crew have done to uh, alleviate that there. There will also be a um, laminated sheet in that pack with all the safety phone numbers, all the phone numbers of all the race officials, um, all the race call signs, and the police, Coast Guard, everything will be in that pack. The Harbour Master's number will be there. So it's all, and we, we talked to the Harbour Master about a week out before the event because we do get cruise ships in. Um, so we've got to be careful of what uh, what we get, but we believe this year we may have no cruise ships at all at the present time. So um, that is that side of things. Um, we want to be able to be, as usual, we'll be late, you know, we do with the Coast Guard and, and, and then, but one thing we did find, and I don't think it's going to be unique to us, is that if you're on a signal boat, whether it's a keeler, if a emergency call comes over on channel 16, is that going to be heard? Because a lot of the those keel boats have their radios down below, which is understandable. And the only one on top is a handheld radio, which the race officer will be using on the Pacific Channel for that race course. So this was signal as a as a high priority for us. So because of that, we're going out and buying ten more handhelds. So all our support boats that we have, all our signal boats, and as many as possible, we'll have two radios. One will be held on 16, and one will be held on the course channel radio channel. So there's no way we should be able to miss anything that comes up, because there'll be two radios up on deck, and, and plus the main one down below. So uh, hopefully that's going to eliminate any of that type of uh, issue that we have now. Um, and uh, so that's really what is in what we're looking at doing. And uh, it's just one of those things. We've all learned a hell of a lot lesson from it. And um, we're just going to, you know, there'll be the, the, obviously the race committee, race officers will have a briefing every morning like we have done in the past. Um, and uh, because we've got three different race courses over, over the whole Bay Area, um, when we have a heavy weather like we did this year, the two inner and outer courses have a starting area further up in the harbour. And that caused an issue this year um, with the fact that they were trying to sail courses through the island racing start line and finish lines as well. So, But we're going to um, alleviate that by new courses um, being written uh, for, next, for the following year, for next year. But um, we are limited as far as this new marine mammal sanctuary, as far as putting in short courses for the uh, island racing. So we've just got to come up with um, what we can do to, to put shorter courses in. It would have been ideal to go around Rollington Island and back again, but we're not allowed to anymore. So um, that's another thing we have to come through, work our way through. There's some challenges. The um, challenges so we had were radios. Um, some of the from the oh, sorry, um, I think you might have frozen for a second there, Ian. But I guess in summary, what are you? What are your sort of overall takeaways? Um, you know, out I of this. I think takeaways are is communication is the main is the main thing. Make sure you got full communication, and um, 
you have a plan in place if you need to to put one together in a hurry. To and we are lucky and respected. We are probably one of the fewer um, big events of keel boats that have safety boats or mark lane boats out in the areas. We don't start from a tower and send the boats away and come back and finish at the tower. We have three courses. We have mark lane boats. Um, on those courses, we have a floater, which is a big rib which goes around all three courses. So it's just keeping the eyes and ears open everywhere to make sure everybody's aware of what's going on. Um, and really, is just to, you know, to make sure everyone knows it. And um, anything that comes up from the from any of the competitors that it's taken note of, and either from the signal boat or anybody else who can hear it. And the, right. the, float, the, the floater actually has will have four radios now because he has a radio for each course channel and he'll also have the 16 radio as well. So uh, we should be covered by communications. Thank you very much, Ian. Really appreciate um, you coming on tonight and um, sharing um, your experiences and, and um, what's going to be different at the regatta. Um, this coming year. Really appreciate it. So on behalf of everyone here tonight, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Right, moving along, we will now um John is sitting there with his microphone off, which is fantastic. So I'd like to um, introduce John Henry from Sands. Um he's an experienced race officer with running Sands events. Um particular around North Island and um, around New Zealand races, which are category safety category level twos. Um, and tonight John's going to share how the Sands Committee prepares for keelboat events, um, emphasising regatta information and safety expectations to competitors. So welcome, John. Um, we're going to run through these three themes um, in, in our conversation tonight. So we've got um, we're going to talk about your event teams, how SANS set up their teams, how they communicate to their competitors, and um, some of the safety um, components that they have in place with their events. So, starting off with the event team, John, can you tell us a bit around how you guys um, bring together an event team um, for your events? Uh, yeah, um, nearly all of our committee, uh, people who have done these types of events, um, which is really important um, so that, um, you know, they understand the requirements of it. Um, I've been race director now for uh, 10 years um, and come from uh, participating in two round North Islands and one round New Zealand race. Um, so um, not that we don't want help from other people, but we like to, uh, if they're multi-day sometimes multi-week events, um, which are unlike any other sailing events uh, in New Zealand. So therefore, we um, we feel um, you need the experience of either being involved um, as support or um, sailing in these events to you know, fully understand the requirements. So um, we have um, uh, usually myself as race officer, um, and a assistant race officer, so that 24 hours around the clock, we've always got one person who's directly um, um, responsible for keeping um, everything on track. Um, we also have a completely separate and independent safety officer because the, the desire to keep a race on track and happening um, can often conflict with a safety officer's um, uh, job of keeping uh, uh, somebody safe on the water. So our biggest risk in shorthanded sailing is a man overboard situation. Um, and we um, are very you know, um, conscious of the fact that um, this, this is probably, you know, the, the worst scenario is, um, and it has happened in the past where somebody's been lost overboard. Um, so um, we put into place a lot of uh, things uh, so that uh, to try and avoid this, um, and um, I think um, the um, 
that we, what we try and do is we try to make our communication with our competitors prior to racing as clear as possible by keeping our documents as simple as possible. Um, our notice of race um, generally is, um, we have a saying in our committee whereby the notice of race needs enough information for you to book your flights. Um, you need to know what um, the race is, where it is, when it is, and how to prepare your boat um, and your crew. So what safety requirements uh, over and above the category uh, of the race and um, yeah, the, um, the, the duration of the race. So we try and keep that as simple as possible. Um, on the water, sailing is, uh, is covered by the sailing instructions, which we usually release um, only a couple of weeks short of these major events. Um, <laughs> so there is, that, that leaves a big hole in um, the communication. So what we have is unofficial communication. We have a, um, a race guide, um, which gives us um, the, um, hopefully answers everyone's questions that haven't, that are, that are wanting to know, know more information about how the race will be run, how the legs will, will be restarted, the time of the stopovers and all that sort of stuff. Um, and this is an unofficial document, it's just a guide. Um, so if I get lots of questions six months out on a particular topic, um, I can then go in and edit that and resend it to everyone so that they've got um, the information they need without having to um, do amendments to notice the rates and sale instructions and the likes. So um, this, uh, yeah, very, very useful document for preparing for the race. And this has come from um, lessons learned by uh, lots of competitors doing this event over the year. Um, the, let's go back a slide. Other, um, so the, um, the other thing that we do is um, a listening watch must be maintained on channel 16 whilst racing. Um, we don't start races on channel 16. We do that on channel 77. And then once the boats have cleared the start, um, they must maintain a listing watch on 16. Um, coming back to the man overboard scenario, um, the most likely people to help a competitor in the water will be the boat, you know, boats around them. So um, we try and keep, um, yeah, keep, keep communication between the, um, the boats um, as a high priority. Um, we also, inform obviously Coast Guard. Uh, we have a big um, uh, relationship with Cordia uh, Maritime Radio um, and they, um, so we document the race with them well in advance. Um, they set up the, the fleet as a group and follow the fleet on AIS, which is another requirement that we have for all competitors so that they're able to, uh, uh, in, the, in the event of a uh, an incident, they know exactly where everyone are. Um, we also have pre and post leg declarations. Um, so the declarations for the pre leg uh, is, um, you know, the, the, the main concern is, is your boat in the category that it's, uh, it, it needs to be? And are you fit and able to sail the next leg? Um, the post league declarations tend to be based around any rules that were broken, um, any damage to your boat that would um, negate your category status, um, et cetera. Um, we also supply a fail communications plan, which is a document uh, we laminate and supply to each boat, which outlines the, all the contact details of um, uh, Maritime Radio, uh, right through to the Rescue Coordination Centre, um, <laughs> obviously the race officer, safety officer, um, and also what procedures to follow um, if an incident happens so that you've got it written in front of you, um, um, which, yeah, I think is, is quite important. Um, I just, just hold you for a second there, John. I feel like we've jumped a wee bit off, off the PowerPoints that I have prepared. <laughs> so if we go... Um, Move from 
what we had before with the commute comms, the unofficial um, race guide. Yes. You have um, safety statements in your sailing instructions and notice of races um, that you have, um, you take guidance from the competitors and, and, and evolve and, and grow and ensure that they're relevant to the competition. Yes. Yes. So the, the, the big advantage of having the bulk of our committee being people who have competed in these races, um, we try and take the lessons learned from every event we do and then we will review the, um, you know, the, the notice of race and the sailing instructions for the next event. Fantastic. And if there's something in there that you say you're going to do, you're... Yeah, that's the other thing that we're very strict on. Um, we, 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 we strip back our documents so that we don't have any, any waffle in them. Um, if we say that you will be penalised for missing a position report, um, it's a safety requirement. Um, as was mentioned to me uh, when I was running my first run with Ireland in 2014, if you don't penalise somebody for not reporting their position, you are penalising all the other boats that have reported their position. So um, we um, we put in our uh, sailing instructions that you will, will be penalised, a 1% time penalty for um, missing a position report. So we have twice daily position reports. Um, and we, yeah, we, we follow through um, because there's no point in having safety regulations um, and then not not following them. Absolutely. And you have, you know, fairly, um, you adhere to strong safety um, checks and, and um, inspections. Yes, yeah, so we do a do a safety audit on every boat prior to the, the start and following any uh, damage or any concern we might have um, if a boat loses, say, a life ring or something on a leg, um, we will do um, a, a safety check. Um, Yacht New Zealand uh, safety inspectors help us with these inspections, which are pretty onerous uh, task prior to the start of, of the North Island race, um, and uh, which we greatly appreciate. Um, Safety inspectors often don't like other safety inspectors checking their boats, but it's just an audit to make sure that things that, um, you know, you, you, you take something wet home in a bucket and it doesn't get back on the boat, so you haven't got, you know, the, the correct number of buckets. Um, you know, your flares have expired since you got your Cat 2 inspection uh, or things like that, you know, like, um, so uh, it's, it's more just an audit rather than a safety um, inspection. Um, but yeah, we, we, we inspect every boat prior to the start. Just it. All right. If, we look if, at... boat, boats, if boat fails on anything, um, and generally we will have one of one or two things we will we will notice um, on every boat. Um, surprisingly, um, you know, the batteries might be flat in a lot in a in a um, uh, man overboard light or something like that. Um, and yeah, these are things that it, that happens to everyone. Um, so all we require is that they remedy that prior to the start, but we do have in our sailing instructions that if you don't meet the safety standard, your entry will be cancelled. All right, so looking at um, the safety plan, how um, how do the, the safety plan and your notice of races and sailing instructions work together? Um, Safety plan is um, a completely separate document, and it's how we um, we will run the race and how we what what, we, what our procedures will be in certain situations. Um, the safety plan is a living document, so it evolves and it changes um, as the event goes on. Um, case in point being Cyclone Gabriel in February this year, and having to. Um, as the race got renamed this year, the um, there and back to see how far it is, um, instead of the round North Island, um, we were unable to sail up the east coast. Um, it was uh, deemed to be um, uh, not a not a good decision to to send boats up that way. Um, so um, yeah, we we changed our safety plan and we changed our race to suit the the situation. It's a living document. Yes, yes. So it's, uh, it's it's great to have a safety plan, but it shouldn't be something that's put away and only dragged out after after the event. It needs to be a, um, and that's where why we find it so important to have a safety officer, um, because that is their job is to to do that. 
Um, the other thing we do is we run a log book um, for all all long races, or in fact, most of our races where we'll run a, a run sheet um, where we will record um, everything um, that may seem like a minor incident, a misposition report, um, and what procedures we follow um, from there. Um, so uh, that way we can have continuity between um, change of, of watch of our uh, race team, which um, most um, most events don't have to have to run a watch system for their race management team, but obviously round the clock, um, you know, event that runs for two weeks, or in the case of Brand New Zealand for for a month, um, you know, we have <coughs> a rolling uh, team that um, can have to be able to take over and need to be able to. So there's a a, a log book that uh, goes with those events that's um, handed over with an update. Uh, no different to how you would be sailing offshore um, on a boat. Um, we run very similar procedures. Um, I guess jumping back to the safety plan, um, a big part of that safety plan is the risk management of the event. Um, as you said, you update it as you go, but the, the mitigations that you come up with as you um, process the risks that can be really useful as guidance for briefings and the likes as you communicate to competitors? Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, so the um, <laughs> it, it's, it's not only about communicating with the competitors, it's also keeping a, um, uh, documenting uh, the changes that are made along the way um, to um, yeah, keep, keep everyone safe and to keep a record of, of, of what, what happens as we go along. And a bit of a Bible for when you do need to go into crisis management or emergency procedures. Yes, yes. So part of our, part of our um, like safety plan is the fact that we will supply foul communication. So if a boat's unable to communicate with us um, or uh, anyone else, um, they've then got a, 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 yeah, a, a check sheet to work through, um, and that's part of our safety plan, to know that we have provided the competitors with the information. Um, just listening to what Ian was saying before, um, we obviously are, are in a different situation to a, <coughs> a regatta in uh, the Bay of Islands. Um, so we don't um, we don't want boats coming past and waving out and saying that they're racing today. Um, part of the requirement is that you must call up on um, Channel Seventy Seven within an hour prior to the start, and that way we know that at, at least at the start of the event of the leg, your BHF radio is working. And um, yeah, we've, we've, it, it just, it's just another level of safety check that, um, yeah, it's, um, it's not a sail past and wave out and we're here. It's um, my radio is actually working and, and I'm able to communicate. we kind of run through everything that we had prepared to chat about this evening. John, is there anything um, you'd Rainer, like to we add? do have a question. Can I just okay. interrupt yeah. and... The question for John was from uh, Solo Trans Tasman Yacht Race. What pushback do you get from sailors over the penalty for missing a schedule? Is there a time frame either side of the schedule time allowed? Sailing can throw up some issues that a schedule can be missed. Yes, <laughs> is the short answer. There is always pushback. Um, but as I said before, um, um, failing to um, penalise is, is in effect penalising everyone that did make the, uh, the position report. Um, as far as the time timing of that goes, we give a half hour window. Um, so it's um, um, 7 till 7.30 in the morning. It's your position that you are at, at 0700 hours and 1900 hours. Um, and you have half an hour to complete that. Um, as I say to all, everyone at the briefings, um, I don't care if you send it in early, and I don't care if you send it in late. But if you do not, if we do not receive it, um, then you will um, your elapsed time will be penalised one percent. Um, so what we do then is, if a boat at the end of the leg says, "Oh, look, we sent it, but you obviously didn't receive it," so we use a texting system through satellite phones. Um, which goes to a computer base um, that records um, the, the, the positions. Um, and there is 
a potential for that to not work. Um, if somebody can show me from their phone um, where they've sent a position report, we remove it. Um, but um, if, if you, um, you know, are busy putting up a spinnaker and you forget, um, you know, I, don't, I, I honestly don't care if it comes in two hours early or two hours late. Um, I'd rather not two hours early. Um, but, um, you know, if, it came, if, if you forgot, but what we don't want is because we're, part of our safety plan is if we miss two position reports, um, we assume that the boat requires assistance. Um, so, you know, it's, it, we, we, we can't run our procedures if we're not hearing from the boats. So I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. What? It's well, like, um, it's, it's, it's the same as doing safety checks on boats and triple series events and things like that. You you, you sometimes cop flack, but if you, um, we, we tend to, we have the triple series have up to 170 boats um, um, and we will have, we will attempt to do a safety check on a third of the boats in every race. Um, we never get everyone, but there's a very high possibility that you're going to get a safety check. Um, we have a very short checklist of half a dozen items. Um, if a boat fails on that half a dozen items, we will then go through um, and we, we, we change that short list from event to event. Um, and, and it's just putting into the psyche of the sailors that there's a very high possibility if you're doing a SANS event that you're going to be checked so make sure you've got your safety gear on board and we do follow through and we go to um we will protest every boat that fails a safety check so it's not just about the perception that you know you, you're going to get caught um you'll probably get chucked out if you if you haven't got the gear on board right. that, so sort of, that sort of break, brings the safety culture through our whole events that you know we do take se safety seriously and um, yeah, just um, it's it's easy to say. Well, I I, do, I took a bucket home, or um, I thought my flares were good, or whatever. Um, if you haven't prepared your boat, um, yeah, um, pr prior to you're not as a competitor, you're not taking safety seriously. And if we're not taking safety seriously, then we're negligible in our role. I think that's a wonderful way to wrap up actually John so thank you very much for your uh, input tonight we really appreciate it um, it's great to have um, to hear from you and I see some of the SANS team are on the night on here tonight um, supporting you um, so I think Bob you put your hand up for a question but we might just hold and move into um, our next segment and then we can open up to some questions a little bit later on so thanks John appreciate it no moving on to our next John We've got a John Butcher online. Um, John, you can unmute yourself, please. Um, so John is a yacht owner, ex-commander in the Royal New Zealand Navy and a former Commodore of the Gulf Harbour Yacht Club. Um, so John is here tonight to share some ideas on how clubs can encourage a safety culture, um, which is a great segue from John, the other John, um, and their member um, boat owners and crew. So welcome, John. It's great to have you here. Thanks very much, Raina, and uh, good evening, everybody. And um, I just say the, the sequencing of uh, tonight's uh, storytelling uh, feels about right. Um, I, I also really enjoy the uh, the sands racing, uh, and I too have had the uh, the random safety inspections, uh, and um, and I'll touch on. Uh, on, the, on that sort of thing uh, during um, the points that I cover. My exposure to, uh, to safety uh, uh, over a career of uh, more than 40 years uh, at sea um, has, uh, has taken me uh, into uh, um, some fairly diverse uh, spaces, um, safety around um, missile firings, safety around um, uh, small, medium and uh, large calibre weapon uh, practices, uh, safety of launching and recovering aircraft and sea boats at sea functions. Um, and then uh, dear to our hearts uh, on this forum, uh, safety uh, within uh, organisations such as your clubs, 
uh, in safety uh, on boats that I've been a crew of, and certainly uh, safety on boats that I'm uh, I'm a skipper of. Um, I've had bad days at sea, and I've had uh, good days at sea. I just would like to put one sort of caveat out there now over, I guess, what I'm going to share, and that's uh, um, I like to sort of stick in the back of my head, and certainly in any organisation that I'm leading and, and uh, have a leadership role in with uh, safety is mission first, and uh, and I got that loud and clear from, uh, from John's uh, brief. Mission first, let's execute the SANS. Uh, race, but safety always, uh, and that prevailed loud and clear. And that's something that I, I'm personally uh, pretty hot on. I've got top five sort of points for uh, each area. I've got two areas. One is at the, the more operational level, which is clubs to uh, the boat owners, skippers, and then the next piece is uh, skippers to crews. Uh, and I want to talk about sort of uh, implementing and encouraging that uh, positive safety culture. Um, I think it's really important, and um, when I say I think, uh, I'm, I'm saying from uh, some successful experience, um, it's really important to have a safety officer in your organisation who is the safety champion, who is supported by other people who, who are interested in safety uh, and do have experience in that space. And they may or may not be in your club, you know, Ask other clubs for support. Ask Yachting New Zealand for support. As a result of tonight's forum, ask some of us or one of us. Um, I would hope that the uh, the comms goes um, goes rather sporadic after this uh, evening. That safety champion within your club needs to be supported by club leadership. Club leadership needs to understand that uh, a safety brief needs to needs to have time allocated to it. And, um, and and sticking a safety brief on the back of another brief uh, prior to the season's racing uh, starting is probably planning uh, to not have safety given the priority that it deserves, okay? Um, Safety-only evenings are really good. A great way to uh, get the message across, and what can happen is um, is a plethora, an absolute deluge of information is conveyed, and it's conveyed in a very talking at type manner. Um, and I've seen this on a number of occasions, and in, 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 in you know quite a number of diverse environments. And um, there's a whole lot of nodding from the audience, and a whole lot of yesing, and um, and the information is all going one way. But if we sort of uh, flip that around and uh, and get people involved and um, and sort of split the whole safety briefing, uh, safety education um, evening up into, say, a number of stations. And um, what I'm talking about here is a concept uh, I've seen used very successfully, and that's called circuit training, um, whereby you might have, say, five or six different um, stations and you might be talking about different uh, topics, uh, different items of uh, equipment, and uh, and you split uh, the group into um, I don't know twenty five people, groups of five, have four or five different um, leaders, champions of that piece of equipment who have had time to prepare for it, and then you can cover a whole lot of um, of stuff in quite a short time, and you can also provide a um, a very warm environment where people feel quite comfortable to uh, to ask questions. Um, what I often find uh, with this particular subject is that there is a fear. There is a fear amongst uh, some participants. There is a fear that they might ask uh, the wrong question. They might feel like they're asking a silly question. Um, or the person who's uh, delivering the, uh, or tasked with, you know, that onerous burden of uh, tasked with being the safety officer doesn't feel 100% supported um, or isn't 100% supported, plus, plus. Uh, and might not have had the time. So if we can share share that load, then uh, we can make we can make it a far more informative, uh, positive uh, education um, evening. Um, inside inside our clubs and inside our community, um, uh, we have a a wealth of experience and. Um, 
And I, I do uh, suggest that we need to tap into that more uh, as, a, as a community. Um, some fantastic uh, knowledge out there and uh, some fantastic safety briefs uh, I've attended uh, over the years. I've always come away uh, learning something and, um, and being able to take those pieces uh, back into different clubs is, uh, is such a, uh, a valuable um, opportunity. Um, the no blame culture, okay to be vulnerable culture, no fear of reporting culture. Um, I was surprised, uh, um, and um, I'll just throw it out there. No, I won't. I won't. I'll be. I'll be very general. If an incident occurs on, I suggest if an incident occurs on my boat, that I will be reporting. If somebody has a near miss with uh, life, or uh, there is a, a near miss. Um, of some sorts, then some sort of report needs to uh, needs to occur, not for the sake of reporting, for the sake of actually we you know we're talking about lessons learned, okay? Well, actually, they're not learned if they're just recorded. They're actually lessons observed. So we need to take ourselves from a lessons observed space into a lessons learned space. And then, and when a lesson, you know, following some sort of incident, minor, medium, or major occurs, change needs to occur for that observed lesson to become a learned lesson. I think that's a really important um, uh, shift that people need to uh, understand. Um, we had an incident in my club uh, a few years ago, September 2019. Uh, we had a man overboard, and. Um, uh, you know, an analysis of the situation occurred and a, and a post-incident uh, report occurred, which was uh, shared internally uh, and uh, externally. And changes occurred as a result of that. And um, in this particular case, the Swiss cheese effect was well and truly in force and a lot of those holes lined up and it could have ended badly. And, uh, and I believe that we were very lucky uh, on the day. Um, that information has been shared with Yachting New Zealand and I'll happily uh, share it with um, anybody who directly asks me. The no blame culture, that is, um, that's essential. You know, if something goes wrong, people um, need to feel comfortable that they can stick their hand up and say, hey, this went wrong. Um, I might need some help, okay? Um, Flip that around. If something goes wrong, and uh, you know, and uh, and leadership of the club, including the safety officer, um, they need to feel comfortable that they can actually approach uh, um, the the club member and say, "Hey, this went wrong. Uh, you know, where are you at with uh, with sort of fixing that? Uh, and or what can the rest of us learn about it? You know, what can the rest of us learn about it? Because uh, it becomes if 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 that if they're okay to be vulnerable and sticking your hand up and saying, hey, this went wrong, if we can actually tap into that and share that story, then we can help uh, enforce, encourage, and ultimately uh, implement. In a non-regulatory, we always need to have some rules because this is safety, it's not negotiable. But do we want to live and operate in a regulated environment for fear of being inspected? Or do we want to live in a regulated environment with no fear and everybody welcomes the safety officer to come down and have a look at their boat? I would suggest the latter is the best um, space to be. So that's my first section, uh, Raynor, uh, at the sort of op level, club to uh, club leadership to club. Uh, and I'll happily move on to um, skipper's owners encouraging and implementing a safety culture on board their boats, uh, if you're ready. Yep. Change screen. Can you see that? Okay. All right. Um, the timing's everything, eh? Um, small story to start with, and we're good for time. Had a training day on my own boat on uh, Sunday. Um, brought together ladies' team for a forthcoming 
um, club ladies series for Gulf Harbour and um, four of us, four ladies on board plus myself. Uh, and um, and what do you know, it's blowing 20 to 25, but it's nice flat water. So it's a great day. Um, but uh, what we did is we did start off with a um, we did start off with a safety uh, um, brief, and um, and everybody got involved. So um, planning and preparing the boat and having crew safety uh, training periods. I think um, so. I'm going to pass on some personal sort of tips and processes now. Um, yes, the uh, the the message needs to uh, needs to come from the skipper. Um, what I have uh, found in the past that works good is is yes that take that leadership role um, when you've got um, uh, a number of people who have been on your boat for um, say a number of years um, then there should be a reasonable expectation uh, not a hope a reasonable expectation uh, depending on how the safety culture has prevailed and, and the knowledge the knowledge on the boat has um, has grown. Um, that they know something about your boat and they know something about your equipment and they know something about your systems and therefore they can get involved. And what I'm talking about here is um, some good old-fashioned Leadership 101 where we've got a bit of empowerment involved and, um, and we're asking uh, the, the crew to help the skipper um, deliver the, um, the safety training uh, opportunities and and indeed um, picking up those different pieces of kit and um, we're talking about those uh, different procedures and, and and man overboard is always a um, a good one to um, to dedicate some time towards and we certainly did that on Sunday uh, had a dry run session uh, on board and then we're out there um, uh, having a good look at it when we were um, in amongst the sailing drills. So it's really important to involve um, people um, and, 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 and don't put them on the spot, not the first time. Um, it's always good to have a bit of a plan. And, and I heard uh, communication uh, is a key theme in the first two briefs. And, and it's, even, it's even more important at that micro level uh, on board. Um, worth, worth getting a message out, hey, we've got, you know, pre-season sort of... Uh, uh, training day coming out, and I'd like to start the first sort of uh, you know hour or so um, tied up uh, in the in the marina or on the mooring, and I'd like to talk calm um, safety. We had a whiteboard out on uh, on Sunday, and uh, proved to be very effective in just um, uh, calling for the uh, information um, from the group. And the crew ranged uh, from a young sixteen year old uh, lady to um, you know. Ladies in their uh, in their in their early um, early moderate ages. Um, Watch what you say there. Yeah, man overboard training. Um, you know, dry runs, live runs. Do it alongside. Do it at sea. Um, I like to talk about. Um, I've had a man overboard at sea off a ship, I've had a man overboard at sea off a yacht, I've been a man overboard uh, at sea on a yacht and um, what I like to talk about is uh, the IA, the immediate action parts of the drill and you know the worst case scenario I guess is uh, a lot of sail up, plenty of breeze, uh, extras up and it's the middle of the night and you know someone goes over the side and um, there's, for me, there's, uh, you know, sort of the top four. And the number one thing is, and, we, and most of us have got um, chart plotters this, these days, and we've got fairly sophisticated chart plotters. So I like to impress upon my team, mark the plot. Hit the mark the plot uh, button on the chart plotter. And everybody's got to know how to do it, okay? And they've got to know how to do it under a bit of pressure. Get those horseshoe life rings over the side, um, and um, and ideally they are they're both lit and they've got a drogue. Get them over the side um, because uh, looking for a head in sea state three plus, you know that's 
one and a quarter high, one and a quarter meter high waves, looking for a little head that's held up ideally by a life jacket if they were wearing one, if they were wearing one that inflated, if they were able to inflate theirs, if they hadn't hit their head as they fell over the side. Looking for that head is bloody impossible. So the the uh, the horseshoe life rings, they uh, they are there for the person in the water. They're also there for the uh, for the boat to um, to help search for that um, person in the water. They refine the datum of the person in the water. Mark that plot. Get those life rings over the side. Raise the alarm. Raise the alarm. Encourage that to be a, an almost automatic um, response both internally and externally. This is an emergency. Um, I always impress upon my team, this is an emergency, okay? I expect us to be sending a mayday, okay? We haven't got the person back on board yet. We haven't got them back on board yet, okay? And, um, you know, the water at the moment is just under 16 degrees gone up two degrees or so in the last um, couple of months. It's pretty cold out there still. If they're wearing the right gear or the wrong gear, you know, their survival chances are, um, are appropriately changed. And that, and that other piece that i um, very hot on uh, is a dedicated lookout. And that dedicated lookout goes eyes on the person in the water and they don't and they don't take their eyes off that uh, person in the water. And I find if, uh, if those four get done uh, fairly much initially, then, um, then we can move on to other stuff like uh, getting engines started, uh, having checked over the side that sheets aren't in the way, et cetera, getting sails uh, shortened or taken down, and, uh, and we start to manoeuvre to recover. And then it's a whole different game. We've got to stand by to render first aid and um, et cetera, you know, having successfully got the person on board. And, um, you know, who's ever tried to uh, get somebody on board a yacht uh, in sea state two or three who is um, capable of getting of assisting themselves or not capable of assisting themselves? It's a fairly difficult task. So my point my point is, uh, and it's the fourth bullet, um, we can talk about it, we can brief it, but um, we should take the opportunity to go and do it because it's a fairly tough task to do uh, when reality arrives. Um, I find it um, really useful uh, in terms of that onboard safety culture to... Um, to get everybody uh, involved and comfortable with um, just being in inquisitive. In my in my previous career, we called it being professionally curious, being professionally curious, knowing how your kit operates, knowing how knowing how I say a throw rope operates, you know. Um, and uh, I find that an interesting one because that, if that throw rope is not properly packed, it's not going to throw very far. It's reasonably good examples, stuff like that. Um, yeah, look, uh, another couple of good little points um, is uh, having a boat plan, having a nicely drawn schematic boat plan. Uh, I think it's safety category three at least requires you to have that uh, on board your boat. I have a nod from uh, John Henry there, um, and it needs to be a decent um, um, boat plan. And a good way of your crew learning your boat is to is for them to take that boat plan and then say walk themselves, or you walk them through it. Actually, walk them through it the first time and show them where the stuff is, you know, and, and apply a bit of uh, system to it, you know, uh, forward to aft and um, or uh, and, and go clockwise or anti clockwise and uh, and just work work your crew around the uh, different pieces. That's when you discover stuff like uh, uh, those flares I bought a couple of years ago. They're out of date now, or um, uh, that's the uh, that's the actual switch there. How the um, how the radio um, just between say international calling and distress and uh, dual frequency coverage uh, and or oh there is a handheld remote. Yeah, 
that's how we work through and we um and we learn. And um, another piece I also like to do at the end of a day, and not for the sake of doing it, um, you know. And you got to couple this with, uh, say, the you know the results of the day. You know, has everybody had um, everybody had a safe day? Yep, no one got hurt, boat didn't get damaged. Has everybody had a lot of fun? Yep. And if you've uh, you know got a good result, then that's obviously uh, got everybody in a fairly buoyant sort of mood. But um, just talk about the other stuff as well, other stuff while you're having that uh, team debrief at the end of the day over a drink or something. Uh, you know, what went right today and what didn't go so right and uh, and how could we make it better next time? What a useful framework to have. Not not talking about introducing, uh, please don't please don't think I'm talking about introducing, a, you know, a very defined era of formality on board. Um, I've just found that uh, the results are better when you've had that um, that debrief uh, at the end of the day. It um, seems to make a um, a, uh, a very positive uh, um, outcome. I guess I'm going to finish off now with uh, one little piece here, uh, which is um, if we all taught one person one thing uh, in the course of uh, this uh, safety culture implementation uh, and maintenance of a safety culture, if we all taught just one person, then we'd be in a fairly, um, a fairly powerful uh, situation. And um, using our community, because this is a very powerful community, if we use the total community, um, we're all going to go forward in this space. Uh, that's me, Raina, unless you've got any uh, other points you want me to draw out. I think that's wonderful. Thank you very much, John. Really appreciate um, your input this evening. Um, sure, just mute. just, just uh, looking at the, the time, I'll just shoot through the couple of last things that I wanted to bring up. Um, first is which is um, Addendum D. Uh, now, Addendum D is a document um, that we have at Yachting New Zealand. Um, it hasn't been updated since 2006 and has potentially fallen off some of our club's radars. Um, Essentially, it is the purpose of Addendum D is to enable Yachting New Zealand to maintain a calendar of offshore sailing events conducted by affiliated yacht clubs and organisations. It also outlines the requirements for the conduct of the event by the organising authority and the role of Yachting New Zealand Cruising Inshore Offshore Racing Committee Corp. Um, it, it applies to those hosting races that are safety categories 0, 1, and 2. Um, now, um, we have the full document um, being updated by Cork at the moment, and I will um, share that with um, all of our clubs when it's finalised. It, um, it's been up, a draft has been proposed to the Race um, Management Committee, uh, Race Fishers Committee, sorry, um, and they've got some feedback to send back to Cork around that. Thing Essentially, we're inviting um, registrations for these races to come to us at least six months or longer prior to the event. Um, come into Cork and we also ask for the sailing documents to be reviewed. We will then maintain a race calendar for those um, category zero to two events um, that other organisations can see. This is in the aim of uh, not us all putting on regattas at the same time on those longer um, distance um, um, abilities for, for, the, for the boats to prepare for so we don't end up with overlaps uh, and yeah, issues around that. Leading into that, I would um, like to invite um, people to put their hand up to be a part of a peer review panel um, because essentially we, as part of Addendum D, Yachting New Zealand says we will review the documents. Now, in-house we don't have that expertise in the office, um, so we would like to lean on our our community, um, we know that we've got some amazingly experienced um, sailors, race officials um, with events in that Cat Zero to Two space um, and beyond. Um, race officials, judge, uh, race officers, judges, and all sorts of different experience. Um, at the moment, we have um, used the experience of John and Fred um, from Akarana have been um, working together on their documents and I think it's something that we I would like to have create a community where we can peer review each of our documents um, 
at that high, at that zero to two um, category level, but we could, I'm also um, open to, for us to um, work together about standard, standardizing and sharing um, best practice across documents into other regattas as well. Um, essentially in our um, dinghy space and our, or so not dinghy space, in our national um, championship space, it's not just dinghy classes, we do have a process in place um, where um, national, ra um, national race officers in the race management subcommittee do review documents. So I guess it's taking that model and, and pulling it into um, keelboat, larger events and longer races space as well. So I would love for people to um, just send me a private message or send me an email if you're interested in being basically part of that pool. I can't imagine it's going to be an onerous um, task. And if we've got a pool of four to five or six people, we can um, divvy up um, mm -hmm. engagement space. Last but not least, I'd like to also mention um, a bit more about our Cork Committee, so our Keelboat, Keelboat Inshore Offshore Racing Committee. Um, is a committee that's designed to have representation of our country. Um, we do have uh, members on the committee from Christchurch um, and Southland through the trail yacht um, hat that Peter Henderson wears. Um, but interested in more representation um, from the South, maybe at the top of the South, if there's anyone who's um, online who's interested in, in um, being involved in court. We have great representation from Auckland, um, but and Tauranga now, which is wonderful, but we would love to have some representation from the, the north um, and maybe in the Wellington region. So if anyone's interested in being involved in Cork, it's generally um, we appoint the Cork Committee for um, 12 months, so end of the year, or well, nowish essentially for the next 12 months. Um, so please, again, get in contact with myself or one of the regional development managers um, if you're interested in being involved. It's four meetings a year, all online except for one um, in winter where we fly you up um, and it's an opportunity to share what's happening in um, in, in your region um, as well as hear what's not happening at a national level. I would like to now um, I guess open the floor to comments. Um, happy, I realise we're coming up to eight o'clock so if people wish to drop off that's their time limit but if people are open to stay online um, are our three speakers okay to stay online for a little bit longer if we've got questions to answer? Any thumbs up? Fantastic. Um, so I guess Kelly, or Wayne, um, uh, Ian and Hayden, has there been any questions come through? Or if anyone wants to put a hand up and ask any questions, please do so. I can't see anyone. Or you can turn your camera on and Turn the video uh, mute off mute. There are any questions? Doesn't look like any more questions. We've answered all the questions. Fantastic. Can, okay. I, um, can I say something quickly oh, then? Sure. Um, I'd just like to say thanks very much to everyone, um, to Rona and also John Squared and Ian for um, sharing tonight. It's been really good. Um, John, thank you for your time of had to call on you in the Sands races twice when I've fallen off the boat or lost the rudder 60 miles off the coast. Um, the skeg or calling in has always been um, a key thing for us because we know we need to keep you in the loop for when we need help. So I just want to support your comment around that. It's very critical. We keep a list on the boat and alarm and we plan our call in the same way we plan attack or drop a sail. Yes, things happen and you can't make it, but we actually plan it in to our um, journey, as it were. So um, just supporting you on your comment there. Um, other John, we sail on sports boats now. We've got them up to Keeler. So we're really proficient at losing someone over the side because normally they're hanging on a string. Um, so we actually have a habit on our boat. If it's within the three minutes of the start, if we see a hat, a piece of rubbish, or a piece come off our boat, the, the rum can, um, we make a point of going and getting it. We go into man overboard process and we practice every time. It means that we actually win or keep our place in races. So if we do lose someone, we're proficient enough to get them and quite often only lose one place. So A, it's fun, it's safety, 
but it's also fast. Okay, and the team's actually done it, but normally as we have a bee on the way back in, what have we broken? What do we learn? What do we go faster? And we're, they're actually already doing the debrief. And once again, it's looking after each other. It's making sure we care about each other. But once again, sports boats are there to win. And that's actually making us go faster as well. So um, so I just picking up on your points to say thanks. Thank you so much, Bob. Appreciate you um, chipping in and saying that. That's fantastic. All right. If there's nothing else, then I'd like to um, also finish the meeting by formally thanking the, the speakers again. Um, I feel like I undersold a few of you, actually. I was just thinking, reflecting on um, what you all have um, give to our sport um, is above and beyond what I even outlined in our introduction. So, Ian, you're an international race officer. You volunteer on the Yoni New Zealand Race Officials Committee and, and lead our race management subcommittee. So thank you very much for all of the time that you put into our sport. Um, John, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, John, uh, your time at Sands and service is, is, is absolutely wonderful, the race officer and safety officer, and you're also a Yachting New Zealand inspector, so really thank you for um, everything you do for our sport. And lastly, John, you know, you've given um, your time as a club commodore, um, you've bought your expertise from, your, from the Navy, and you're also a current board member who's also volunteering for our sport. So again, thank you so much. We appreciate everything all three of you have done and giving your time um, to prepare the presentations tonight and the time tonight. So again, thank you, everyone. Um, it's been wonderful having the community together and I look forward to um, doing this again sometime soon. I'm going to stop doing it. I can work out.